Wait a few minutes. Okay, ready to go? Okay. Welcome everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us this, us this evening. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Cynthia Raposo, the current chair of Maryland Humanities Board of Directors. Um, <clears throat> when Phoebe told us that she was leaving Maryland Humanities, we knew it would be a, a real challenge placement. We, uh, we quickly realized that searching for a new executive director was just as much an inward search as it was an outward search. To find our next leader, we had to first evaluate ourselves as an organization to determine what we had achieved and where we wanted to go next. And then we had to find the leader with the vision, the talent, and the skills to take us there. <laughs> After six, a six month nationwide search, and it was an intense search because we had to deal with all the restrictions imposed by the, by the pandemic, which I'm sure many of you know, <laughs> we found Lindsay Baker in our own backyard. And over the past month and a half, I've had the opportunity and the pleasure to spend many quality Zoom hours with Lindsay. And I am convinced now more than ever that we have found the next right leader for Maryland Humanities. Um, I'm also pleased that uh, uh, joining Lindsay in conversation tonight will be Yolanda Vasquez, a former member of our board of directors. And she's going to put her award-winning journalism talents in action for us tonight. Thank you, Yolanda, for staying connected to Maryland Humanities and sharing your time with us tonight. We really appreciate it. And it's so great to see you. You always put a smile on my face. <laughs> um, one housekeeping note before we get started. If you have questions for Lindsay, uh, we ask that you use the Q&A function um, as opposed to the chat function. The chat function is going to be open, but that's for you if you want to communicate with your fellow attendees uh, during the program. Um, and I think that's it. So take it away, Lindsay and Yolanda. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. It's always a pleasure talking with you, seeing you as well during this um, very difficult time in all of our lives. And it was always a pleasure to be a member of the Maryland Humanities. Now, I just have to show you something real quick. When I was a part of the board, this, this is my going away cup, by the way. Mm -hmm. It was Maryland Humanities Council. This was back in 2012 to 2015. So I just wanted to say I enjoyed being a part of the board. And once you become a part of Maryland Humanities, you, you like never leave, it's family. It definitely is family. So I am, I am uh, blessed and honored to have this opportunity to speak with your new executive director, Lindsay Baker. So without further ado, because I know people may have some questions for you, let's get rolling. Lindsay, how are you doing tonight? I'm perfect, how are you? I'm hanging in there as best as I can. So I'll start off with the first question, which is when people hear the term humanities, it conjures up a plethora of thoughts and ideas and even probably a slew of definitions. Some, some may be right, some may not be right, but what do the humanities mean to you and why are they so important? That's a good question. Um, so we talked about this quite a bit uh, in, in the interview process, which was rigorous as Cynthia noted. Um, and then you get down to the work of it, of running an organization and you don't get to have that uh, philosophical conversation on a day-to-day. -day. You know, we've been in the midst of writing the fiscal year 21 budget and I don't really get to think a lot about what the humanities mean to me. So this is great. This is a great opportunity. Um, I would say for me, I come from the history perspective. Um, and I think a lot about how history connects us, um, how we better understand ourselves, our communities, and um, our families, uh, our friends, and our experiences um, once we understand our history and the peoples um, around us, their history. And so what I'm excited about with Maryland Humanities is adding in the literature component, adding in the civics component. Um, I've heard people include uh, um, law and philosophy. And I think that all of those, those points are all just ways that we understand one another and ways we make, um, we make sense of our lives and, and, and we make sense of the world around us. And so when I think about humanities, I think about it as a tool 
as a tool for us to um, make our lives and, and the world a better place. Let's talk about some of your past jobs. You were at Patapsco Heritage Greenway for two years prior to coming on board here with Maryland Humanities. It's a preservation-based nonprofit headquartered in Howard County. And prior to that, you worked for the Laurel Historical Society for I think about a decade. And I saw a quote somewhere that you put LHS on the map in the museum world, right? Um, what were some of the notable initiatives that you created? Uh, we have fun. I, the, the Laurel <laughs> Historical Society, I mean, uh, holds a really special place in my heart, as does Laurel. I still live here. I moved here for the job. Um, uh, I would say the, the, the most fun we had was around um, the Taste of Laurel. That's an initiative that I started um, my first year, 2008. And it was a free program and we opened it up to um, restaurants to come and people to taste the small locally owned businesses. And just by the nature of, of how Laurel is, and I, I have to be honest, I don't think this was intentional on my part, but then once I caught on to it, I, I totally ran with it. Um, most of our vendors were um, minority or women, but women owned businesses. So that was great. And we were introducing people to places in Laurel because if you know Laurel, you know we have every chain restaurant that's ever existed. But we also have many small locally owned businesses that are great. Um, and that was a really fun initiative that I think really got my feet under me in terms of planning community program. Um, and I'll just say that the last, the kind of like last hurrah at Laurel, um, I left uh, January 2018. And so um, we always open our exhibits on in February. And the last exhibit I created um, with the exhibits committee at Laurel. Um, and we had a different exhibits committee for this, this exhibit. Um, and it was about civic engagement in Laurel. And we had some people who um, felt like maybe we didn't have enough in collections um, when it came to that. But I really pushed hard because I felt like we were in a moment. I mean, remember what, you know, September, October, November 2017 was like? Um, we were in a real moment then um, in regards to civic engagement. And this was before we knew had won, who had won the election. And so that last um, exhibit talked about all forms of civic engagement. And um, I specifically felt really strongly about uh, the, the portions that were about, for example, um, marches and their role. Uh, and that obviously really resonated with people in January 2018, February 2018, to think about what taking to the streets really means and how it can impact you know, the, the legislation and the people around you. So that was, that was a great way to go out, I'll say. How fortuitous of you. And I swear, I swear we did an interview when I was working at Maryland Public Television. I went and I've got, I've got somebody looking. They're looking at the <laughs> archives because I swear we spoke back then. But anyway, your involvement with these two organizations gave you firsthand knowledge of the work that Maryland Humanities does. So what was it about the gig that appealed to you? And it's kind of interesting, like Cynthia said, you were right in our backyard, even though they did a nationwide search. Um, you know, I think Maryland Humanities has a great name, especially in the history field um, in Maryland. And now I know um, for humanities organizations generally in the country, I think we have a good reputation. Um, I'd always been a fan of the work that Maryland Humanities did. And um, I always felt that they were doing impactful, meaningful programming. Um, and so uh, when the gig opened up, I, I think I told you earlier, I really didn't think I would be qualified because I didn't have a PhD. Um, and I, I, I chatted with Phoebe and she encouraged me, no, they're not, you don't have to have a PhD. Um, and so I applied thinking, well, there's no way, you know, this is a dream. This is, dreams don't come true, especially in 2020, right? I mean, it just doesn't happen. So. Um, I was, uh, I, was, I was very excited to get the call back and go through the process. Um, and I just think that the work that they do and the statewide impact that they have um, are, are things that are really important to me. I was looking for another position with wider impact and who's, um, who I knew that the values of the organization more aligned with my own. And hearing um, from Phoebe that they were engaging in racial equity work um, was something that made me think this is, this might be the time. I mean, this might be the time that, that I actually am the right fit for this organization, which it turns out, I, I think, that I am. Hence, here we are. So congratulations on coming <laughs> on board. So I'm gonna do a little mix of personal and professional because I want people to get to know you a little better. Um, I hear you're a big time international traveler. 
and you're very in tune with like the native experience. Um, meaning you want people like boots on the ground to tell you and give you a look around. So where have you been and where, once we have a vaccine, I assume, would you like to go? Yeah, I know exactly where you got that information. And I, <laughs> I had some feelings about the term native in that context, but I'll, I'll yeah. go with it and not, okay. uh, not analyze it now. Um, so uh, where have I been? Um, I, the first time I traveled in, well, I went to Canada when I was in college. That's, I, yeah, I count kind of, right? Um, and then the first time I, I flew and went internationally, I went to India. Um, and I went to India because I had studied Indian history, um, mostly as an undergrad. And um, I graduated a semester early from Goucher. And that winter, they um, piloted the first trip abroad to India. And um, for those of you who know Goucher well, they, they since have made it um, mandatory. I don't know what they're gonna do now, but they've made it mandatory that you have to study abroad while you're a student. That wasn't the case when I was there, but it was really great that I was able to take that um, opportunity to, to go. And um, I'll say the bug just kind of bit me. Like I was like, this is amazing. I wanna go everywhere. Um, so I have a friend who is uh, um, an older Sri Lankan woman and she, said to me, do you want to go to back to Sri Lanka with me? Her husband still lives there. And I was like, yes, let's go. Um, so we went, we uh, stayed with her husband. Um, they're Tamil. And uh, for people who know about um, Sri Lanka and the Civil War, um, we went about six months after the official end of the Civil War. And the Tamil are, uh, are the minority um, in Sri Lanka that were uh, being persecuted during the Civil War. I mean, depending on who you ask, right? Because that's history, that's life. Um, so we went and like, maybe it wasn't like, you know, the safest time to go, but it was fine. We were fine. We had a great time. I hung out with her and her husband. And I guess that's when you can use that term native because they actually are native to Sri Lanka. Um, then her and I went to, and I'll hurry up because I could talk about travel all day. Um, her and I went to South Africa. Um, her husband has, because again, when, when countries go through civil war, populations go everywhere, right? So. Her husband had a cousin that lived in South Africa. So we went and stayed with them and her husband flew over from Sri Lanka. Um, and we had a great time there. Again, getting like staying in somebody's house, cooking with them. You know, a lot of times we would go to their, their kids' schools, their places of worship, things like that. Um, I next went to uh, Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago. I have a good friend who um, played uh, soccer with me at Goucher. I'm very good friends with her and her husband. Her husband is Trini. So we went back, stayed with his grandma, stayed at a hotel, did the whole thing, had lots of doubles. It was wonderful. Um, and then Mexico, a wedding in Mexico somewhere there. And uh, where do you want to go? What's the bucket list? Well, I want, I, we went to El Salvador. I went to El Salvador with my husband's family. I want to go back as much as we can with my husband's family so that my um my kids know the country um oh we went to france too i went to france with a friend who was staying in france for a year that was my first time in europe was this fall so on the bucket list honestly is anywhere where i know someone who knows what the good food is to eat where the good museums are and where the open parks are i mean really like anywhere anywhere i can go where someone has that insider knowledge i want to be there I kind of girl, you and I can be travel buddies. That's how I like to roll. <laughs> so you mentioned soccer, right? That's a good segue. Soccer is a big part of your life. You played defense for the Goucher Gophers several years. Um, you also played, is that it? Is it really the Gophers? Yep. Okay. Also played <laughs> adult indoor soccer league. Do you still play? And, and what do you like about the sport? Wow, you did your research. Um, I do still play, not not right now because of COVID, uh, but I I played um, up until almost the end of my first trimester this time. Um, uh, I, you know, there's not much that helps me relax in the way that soccer does. Um, I'm really needing it, you know, during this kind of difficult time. Um, and I really, I really appreciate the connections you make with people on the field. Um, and And there are some people I've been playing with I mean, some people I've been playing with since Goucher. I always have an open spot on the teams that I run for people from Goucher. Um, but there's some people I've been playing adult co-ed with for 10 years on and off. Um, and oftentimes they're not like, they're, they're not white women, so they're different. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how I would have met them other than soccer. And I, I have really strong 
kind of deep relationships with people I meet on the field and just continue to play with over the years. Cool stuff. I played soccer when I was younger as well. Kept getting, you know, really bad um, problems with my shins. So I, I, my legs were too cute. So I, I had to stop. I had to I don't, find another I don't have sport. cute legs, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah, soccer tends to be one of those rougher sports. So um, switching back to more on the professional level, and I know this from personal experience, you have a very, very experienced staff and a super, super strong board. Um, how do you plan on leveraging those two entities to sort of propel Maryland Humanities to the next level? Yeah, so I would say, what the, I guess the first question would be, what is next level for us, right? Okay, and, there you go. And, and so I would say, um, right now, we're really deeply engaged in, in racial equity work. They started that before I came. It really dug in in fall of 2019, and now everyone's hip to it, right? Like, everybody's trying to do this work, um, and we're trying to continue it. Um, and I see the board and the staff being central to that. We're trying to operationalize that work. So that means that it goes um, really deep. It's in everything that we do, internally looking at our policies and procedures, externally looking at our partnerships and our programs. And that I've been in organizations where I'm pushing that by myself or with a very small crowd of people. Um, and so I would say that the strength of the board and the staff is that they really believe in this and they are invested in this work. And we might not know exactly how we're going to move forward with it, but I think that their belief and their investment is going to make us successful in this process. This next question sort of dovetails into the racial equity work that you're speaking of that Maryland Humanities is embarking on. So I read somewhere that you want to build a wider understanding of lives that don't look like yours. And, and you kind of, you and I talked about this in our little pre-interview, but, but why is that so important to you? Good question. Um, they're all good questions, by the way. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know, because we're all people, right? Uh, and like, if I only understand my own life, then what is, what is, what is my life about? If I only understand the context in which I live, um, and I, I just feel, I feel like there's a, there's a lot of missed connections because of cultural differences, language differences of people who would really get along given the opportunity to know one another's backgrounds a little bit better. Um, and I think that that's, that's really important to me that I don't miss those opportunities to know people just because we come from a different culture and therefore, you know, we just see things differently or we hang out differently or whatever. So I, I just think that's really important to me is to not miss those connections and to not help I want to build those connections as well with within my friends and family network. And I think one of the ways in which you do that, at least from our conversation, has to do with reading, right? Because as 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 it's been talked about and, and documented everywhere, you're you're a bit of a bibliophile, right? You you love reading books and and you were telling me about how you used to read books at the dinner table and you know sort of got chastised from your parents by by doing that, but. Um, is there a certain genre of books that you like or, you know, any favorite authors? You, you talked to me earlier about some of the books you've read, but what are you reading now? I mean, oh man. Um, right now I'm trying to finish Anxious People, who was a speaker, uh, Frederick Bachman, who we had earlier from Maryland Humanities. It's a good book. It's not difficult to finish. I'm just, you know, a mom of two kids who need a lot of time. Um, <laughs> But I would say that um, when I was finishing at Goucher, I felt really strongly that there was just so much to learn. I could only read nonfiction. And I, I'm, I'm telling you this because I think it's a really interesting perspective when you think about literature and you think about the humanities. Um, and so I finished at Goucher and I had a friend who had taken African-American literature um, and she let me borrow all of her books. And so that semester early that I was done school and hadn't started uh, graduate school, I read all the books um, from her African-American lit class. And I realized how much I had missed the boat on reading, right? Because non nonfiction is important, right? I can't be a history major and not think that. Um, but literature is so is also so important. And so um, I think it's just so helpful in understanding other experiences in a way that nonfiction is just not the same. So I would say that now I read a lot of, um, I guess it's still called nonfiction, but telling me how to get my kids to like sleep and, you know, things like that. Um, and then literature I, I save for like when I can think about things other than when to get my kid to go to sleep. Got it. Is there a book you'd recommend to, to any of us or all of us to read, like a must 
a must read in your, your file? I really, I really should have thought about that beforehand, okay. right? No, that's okay. Um, but uh, if you're a mom, and I would say, or a dad, or a parent, or a caregiver, let me, let me uh, rephrase. If you're a caregiver, there's a really great book that I've given to many, um, many of my friends who have been pregnant. Um, it's called Expecting Better, and it's by a statistician. And she looks at all of the, I'm sorry, like maybe this isn't where you want the question to go, but that's where we're going, all right? So yeah. <laughs> um, she looks at all of the studies that have been done about things like, you know, don't eat sushi and, you know, don't sleep on your left side. And she gives the, the, the statistics background on those studies and how much we should really, she doesn't tell you how much to worry. She gives you all the information and says, and you will draw a conclusion based on your own life experiences, your own needs at that time. And I just, I really love her work. Um, it's called Expecting Better. And she now is doing the same thing around COVID, which has been really amazing, telling you all of the most up-to-date studies, but then giving you context, like saying there were 50 people in this study, so maybe it's not the best study to, you know, Im immediately stop washing your hands or something like that. Um, so I've been, I've been really enjoying her work right now when I need some perspective on all of this, this science that's coming out. Statistician, good stuff, good stuff indeed. Um, so we only got about, let's see, about 10 minutes left, maybe less than that, eight. So let's uh, get about four or five questions before we get to our speed round. A bachelor's degree from Goucher, master's from University of Delaware in History and Museum Studies. You mentioned to me that you juggled a ton of internships while you were in school, and you believe that this made a huge difference in the opportunities that were presented to you once you graduated, eventually becoming an ED of a museum right afterwards. Um, but you have some kind of interesting thoughts on internships as a whole. You care to share that with us? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, right. I said, don't, don't get me started when we talked about this. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, I really strongly believe that unpaid internships are a thing of the past. They perpetuate inequity. Um, they keep the field overwhelmingly white. Um, I think internships are a great experience. I have really strong feelings about how you set them up and how you set yourself up and your intern um, for success. Um, so, I, I mean, I think they're important, but I think that uh, too often, especially the museum field has relied on them for free labor and then complained nonstop about how bad their interns were. Um, you know, that's like a, that's a go-to thing is like, oh, can you believe what my intern did? Um, which might be all fields, I don't know. I'm just from the museum field. Um, so I, I just feel strongly that they need to be paid and you need to be very intentional about the way you set up projects that benefit both your interns and, and the organization. One or two questions personal, then we'll go into the last two of, of the evening. Um, you met your husband, Danny Cruz, in I think it was 2011-ish. Is that how? 2015, actually. 2015, I had it a little earlier. Maybe I knew something you didn't know. Was it through the soccer league or, or some yeah, other we, way? Yeah, we met playing soccer. Soccer. So he's from El Salvador, as you mentioned, and you have two beautiful kids, including a four-month-old. And so God bless you for taking the time to be with us this evening. Um, what are your thoughts on what aspects of your work at the Maryland Humanities you're most eager to share with your family? Um, racial equity work or is it even beyond that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think that my husband inherently sees the value of humanities. And so I think that like I'm starting at that level with him. Um, I think that like many people, he absorbs it unintentionally. And I mean, a lot of people don't even know what the humanities are, right? When you say the humanities. Um, but I think that he is not someone who's going to say, oh, I would love to learn more about that. Let me pick up a book. He, you know, like, it's just funny to say that out loud because he would actually never even conceive of that. Um, but I think that I would really like to show, um, show him. And I know my kids are just gonna absorb it, right? Because you just absorb stuff that your parents do. Uh, how important it is for us to make space for other people and understanding um, again, experiences that are different than our own. We are, uh, you know, we're a mixed race, mixed nationality family. Um, so we will be different from many other people. Um, and this, and in similar situations, again, to other people who are in similar um, relationships. So 
I just want them to understand that their experience is one of many and it has a lot of similarities and a lot of differences, but all of that's okay. Sorry, I was looking at, some, I heard everything you said and I'm looking at some questions that are here. Um, so we have a question for you um, and we will put this one in. Um, we'll just continue having our conversation. How do you think the humanities support our democratic form of government? I mean, I, I think a lot about the kind of citizen that I am, and I think that it's rooted very much in, in my education at Goucher. Um, you know, asking questions, uh, being analytical, um, putting, putting what's happening into a context, whether it's, you know, whether it's history, whether it's civics, I think all of those activities make for a good democracy. And I think that the humanities um, has the ability to get us practice at it again, right? And I mean, maybe not, you know, not everyone went to a liberal arts college and had this, you know, mentality pounded into them for three and a half years. Um, so I think that we at Maryland Humanities have the opportunity to um, open up those learning experiences, open up our, our minds again in ways that we may have, you know, gotten sleepy on or haven't really ever thought, you know, critically in that way. So I think that's all really essential. It's foundational to a thriving and, you know, successful democracy. You have two sisters, one of whom is a twin, Brooke. Is that, is that true? What? You're, you're a twin? <laughs> you're doing a lot of research, Yolanda. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> hey, you know, I gotta, I gotta deliver. I gotta deliver the goods. Um, are you identical or fraternal? We're fraternal. You're fraternal. So um, they're in education along with your mom. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, did you ever consider that path or do you think that education just sort of intersects with humanities in general? No, I, d I don't ever wanna be a teacher and especially <laughs> not now. Nope. <laughs> Nope, we intersect enough. I don't need to get up at 6 a.m. I mean, I get up at 6 a.m. now anyways, but um, being a teacher, at, yeah, no. no. I, love, I love them. And my mom wasn't a teacher, but she worked in schools. Um, okay. and my mom was an extremely, extremely hard worker. I mean, I think I am too, but um, they, uh, they, all, they all work hours with a lot of kids. Like I liked, I liked the before times when I could drop my kids somewhere else and go do my work and not be around kids all day. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, COVID has completely changed the game on that, so. Yes, no, I know. Everybody has the utmost respect for uh, teachers and those who are in the education field because uh, it has really flipped a, flipped a dime on, on how that works. And I hear Brooke is, Brooke is here, so we can give a little shout out. Did you know Brooke was here? I mean, she signed up. Hey, Brooke. Okay. <laughs> You don't have that twin kind of vibe thing going on? Actually, I, we, we like to do this. I knew she was here. I just didn't want to ruin the surprise. Okay. Okay, well, it's great to have her on board. So um, what is, you know, you and I sort of touched upon this when we had our, our pre-interview last week, but what would you say is your long-term vision for Maryland Humanities? I mean, what do you hope they do create and or become over the next few years or however long your tenure will be with the organization? Um, so like, like I touched on before, the racial equity work is really important to me. Um, I am excited to be leading an organization that's ready and is moving forward with it um, and seems completely invested in it. So long-term vision is that that is completely operationalized. It's second nature. We think about it in the same way that we think about how we're going to fund a new program or a new position. Um, so that's, that's number one. For me, that's number one. Um, I've also been playing with the idea of having some kind of foundational programs for Maryland Humanities and then having um, some programs that we bring on, um, you know, we pilot it, we work with partners to spread it across the state, we get it going in those areas and help them or work with them, maybe they don't need our help, right? Um, and then we step back and it's their program and then we move on to the next thing. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity there to grow our statewide impact. I don't know, we're gonna do some strategic planning. I don't know if the staff or the board is on, is, is interested in this model, but it's something um, that I think would make us more nimble um, and allow us to be more responsive. Um, because right now we're really, you know, we're, we're going, we're full throttle. Like it's all staff, all, all working all the time. There's not a lot of room for last minute changes um, and, and 
starting new programs. So that those are kind of the two main things that I'm thinking about. And I'd imagine there's a lot of pivoting that's going to need to be done. I mean, you happen to take the helm of a nonprofit in the middle of a pandemic and I mean, nothing like baptism by fire, right? And, and what I recall and remember from my many years of being on the board at Maryland Humanities and participating in so many wonderful events is that, that, that interaction that you would have um, going to, you know, uh, an event that supported one Maryland, one book, or if you were doing something for Chautauqua, or if you were going to, um, we used to do letters of literacy or about literacy. I remember doing those kinds of events, or even, what was it, Maryland State History Day at UMBC. Like, there's so many things that come in my, my mind about Maryland Humanities, but it was always going to an event, going to a place, and interacting with others. So, um, I know you've only been on since, like, August 3rd, so it's been just a few weeks, but you are, you know, you are thinking of that COVID world, right? I mean, is that difficult to wrap your head around to create these kind of programs? Yeah, I mean, I think that our program staff has pivoted in a way that would impress anyone. Um, but we're planning for next year, you know, we're writing the budget and we're trying to figure out what does next year look like and um, kind of de facto in budget talks, we said, well, let's just assume the first quarter is still is still we're still socially distancing um and so we've written the budget with that in mind but now the you know the closer we get to november the more i am am realizing it's probably going to be past the first quarter um so basically everything we're doing we're doing thinking what changes can be made to put this online and what i've encouraged the program staff to do and they'll i mean they're I, I, they're, they kind of just laugh i think at me but i'm like let's just think about it in you know especially for maryland history day Let's not think about it as, oh, we have to put Maryland History Day online. Maryland History Day brings in like, what, 30,000 students a year? Let's think about making it the best history day that's ever happened, but it's online. So what can we do that we couldn't do when we were in person? We have more flexibility. Let's, let's look at this from a different angle rather than mourning what we can't do and think about what we can do now that we're online. So I'm hoping that that type of mentality shift is, is happening, but it's difficult because there's some mourning there. Yeah, it's funny that you, you are mentioning that because that is sort of a question that came into the chat room about National History Day and how wonderful that, um, that program is, uh, you know, sort of a first class program that Maryland Humanities has run for many years, you know, growing support for the humanities across the state. But uh, the teachers are so stressed these days and the students as well. Uh, and I guess you sort of answered this, but the question is, do you see this continuing in this era of COVID? Is there a way to evaluate how successful homeschoolers have been in the National History Day in Maryland and apply some of those techniques across the state. So something of what you've been saying, well, well just what you're saying now, Amy, <laughs> Amy said it, it's, it's her program that she's on board for. That's Amy Fetterman. Hope, hope we can say your name, Amy, but yeah. So National History Day, you're just going to have to sort of um, be creative, I guess, moving forward. That, that's, that's the ultimate answer. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to do a speed round because we're coming up on that time. She's like, oh, it up. it's okay. I know, I know, I know, I know. So the, the concept behind the speed round is I'm throwing out some, some pretty, pretty heavy topics. Um, and you can give me two words or one word answer. You can elaborate if it's something that's personal or important to you. Um, I wanted to keep it like two minutes if long, if, if possible, I'm sorry, um, for us to just get through it. And I don't even think we'll need two minutes. We, we probably can get through in a minute, minute and a half. And then after that, I'll have one wrap up question and uh, I will open it up to everyone else who's watching. So you ready, Lindsay? Let's do it. Okay. I'll let you slide on the first one. The first one, just for everyone's, you know, purposes, is, was Me Too movement. So I let her slide on that one. Okay. Um, um, we'll talk a little bit more about gender equality. That's not where I thought you were going. Um, <laughs> necessary? One word answer. There you go. Necessary. Police reform way more than necessary, well overdue. Freedom of speech. Complicated. Climate change. Happening. <laughs> She's got the one word answer, rolling boy. Uh, digital divide. I'll do more than one word. That's fine. My sister, my sister who's on right now is a teacher for a KIPP school in Anacostia and it breaks my heart when she's telling me about the digital divide for her kids. So, hey Brooke, that's for you. 
students, students just not having enough computers to be able to do the work they need to do? Um, well, it's a KIPP school, so I think they've like built the internet for these kids. But um, wow. yeah, I mean, there's a major divide and, and I'm witnessing it in other places and it's, it's heartbreaking, especially right now. Yeah, we do hear a lot about, about it in the news, but unless you can deal with it on a personal basis, you probably don't even know. Uh, immigration reform. She's like, where do I start? Where? <laughs> There's not enough time. <laughs> uh, heartbreaking. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> nope, that, that's a good one. Um, I'll throw this one back in. We did it pre, but this is the last one on the list. Black Lives Matter. Uh, all lives can't matter until Black Lives Matter. Excellent. Thank you so much for participating in the speed round. That wasn't so bad, was it? I told you I love speed rounds, so that was great. <laughs> but you were looking more for like, what's your favorite ice cream kind of speed Yeah, round? I mean, I thought we were going there, but that's fine. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, you did, you did well. You did well. So um, before we open it up to everyone, I just want to ask you a little bit about, so, so how can people listening to tonight's uh, Lindsay Love Fest support the humanities and uh, Maryland humanities in particular? I mean, what, what do you recommend they do to get involved? Oh, you mean other than give money? Well, yeah, because that's, it's not always about that, is it? Oh, no, no, it's not always about that. I'm the executive director. It's got to be first and last about give us money. Um, I'm not mad at you. <laughs> yeah, but said like in a nicer way, right? Um, I would say uh, supporting our programs and, the, you know, attending them, passing them along, thinking about ways that your work intersects with Maryland Humanities um, and not necessarily just people who come from libraries or from schools. I'm thinking really broadly about the ways that our work can um, can can strengthen and deepen the relationships in your own work, or can you know um, if you think about the intersection of the environment and healthcare um, and the humanities. I think that there's a lot of opportunities that if people thought more broadly about their own work and their own experiences, that we could maybe you know work together. Wonderful. I, I agree with that. I can, I can say that when I first started to come on the board for um, Maryland Humanities, let's see, uh, any other questions? No, okay, just making sure there aren't any other before I close out, that um, I didn't know much about the humanities. I mean, I was, you know, a 25 year reporter who talked to everybody uh, within a, a subject matter of humanities, but still didn't understand um, the breadth of it. And uh, I remember us having conversations where I, <laughs> one of the things I pitched was like a card what are the humanities? Here are the subjects. Just because I'm always about raising awareness. So I love, I love what you just had to say. And I think that maybe one of the ways that people can start is simply by going to the website. I mean, just, just go to the website, learn a little bit more about the programs and get involved. That was one of the things I loved about being on the board is that Phoebe, the predecessor of Stein, would say, listen, the only way you're going to get to know the work that we do here throughout the state is to attend our events. It's, it's the only way you learn. And and then I can become an ambassador and speak on behalf of Maryland Humanities. And so as many events as I could attend, I made sure I did. So um, I think it's a wonderful organization and they are so lucky to have you. And it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to be able to speak with you this evening, Lindsay. And I wish you nothing but the best as you embark on this new journey with Maryland Humanities. Um, so I don't know if there's any other questions. I, I'm probably at the point where I can uh, turn this over to, let's see, any other questions? Am I missing anything, Aaron? I can turn this over to Aaron at this point. Last call for any other questions. Um, speed round. I, I don't have any other topics. I only did a few because I wasn't sure how, how Lindsay would jump on, but I'm sure she's available to chat with all of you uh, moving forward. Uh, you could go to the ever consider a career in education like your family. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right. We got them all. Um, all right, Aaron, I think uh, I'm going to turn this over to you and I thank you Lindsay for your time and your effort this evening and I look forward to one day seeing you again in person. Yes thank you Yolanda and if you find that interview that I think you're right we did please let me know because I really want to know. No I've, got, I've totally got my producers the problem is they're like well when did you do it? I said I don't know in the last four years maybe five they're like oh you got to help me our archive system was never really good at MPT unfortunately <laughs> and so that I couldn't you know couldn't put just put Baker in or Lowell Historical Society but they're looking and when I find it Dollars to donuts, you're going to be the second person to know. I, I, I'll tell you okay. that right now. Thank but Aaron, you. thank you. Cynthia Raposo, thank you very much. Um, um, so, okay. So okay, thank you, Yolanda. And Aaron said he doesn't need to come on, so we can just say bye. Okay, all right. Well, again, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate your time this evening. 
pleasure speaking with Lindsay Baker. If you have any questions, I'm sure that she's available for you to chat with um, personally through via email or a phone call. So Lindsay, thank you again. And everybody, thank you for your time this evening. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.